Awesome. Well, welcome everyone to our Eats and Inspiration. We, uh, you know, it looks a little different than it has in the past, but we're just really excited to be here and to be able to come together and bring this panel and uh, just get back to doing some of the things that we've done in person. And um, so today we just want to thank our sponsors. Without them and their continued support, we really wouldn't be able to do some of what we do at the YLC. And so those sponsors for today's event is KGA, our YLC annual sponsors, Brookfield Residential and CVL Consultants, and the HBA Gold Sponsor, Ferguson and BAC. You know, we wanna just give a little bit of etiquette about how you can interact with us today on the Zoom call. But you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button. That's where you can put your questions. We'll have three parts and Sarah's gonna get into more about how this is gonna work, but you can put your questions in that Q&A box and we'll be able to answer those live as well as at the end when we do kind of a collaborative question and answer session. You'll also see there's a chat button down there. So please feel free to chat with the other participants as well as the panelists by using that chat feature. And when you see your question and answer, you can also raise your hand. So we can call on you to answer your question verbally. So real excited, and Sarah, I'm gonna pass it off to one of our own YLC professional development committee members and board members, Sarah Kaplan. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, everyone. I hope everyone's having a great day. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Once again, as Sarah said, I'm also a Sarah. I'm Sarah Kaplan, and I'll be your moderator for this YLC Eats and Inspiration event today. So before we dive into our program, just to familiarize you with each of our panelists, I wanted to go ahead and give them a chance to reintroduce themselves to you in a quick minute. So with that said, we're gonna start with another of my favorite YLC members and young professionals, Kevin Junk. Kevin, say hi to everyone. Hey, Sarah. Hey, everyone. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. Um, yeah. Um, Blessed to be on the panel today. Um, really thankful. Um, yeah, my name's Kevin Junk. I'm a uh, civil engineer and land planner um, at Kimley Horn here in uh, Denver Tech Center, coming from a really bright office here. Um, you know, I'm a Colorado native, a CU grad. Uh, my specialty is uh, residential development, single family homes um, here across the west uh, western part of the uh, part of the country. Um, you know, my specialty is working with, uh, you know, as a young leader, um, working with small teams to, uh, to deliver lots and lots of projects. Um, yeah, COVID's been interesting, but uh, lucky to be uh, staying busy right now. Awesome. Thanks, Kevin. Okay, and now we're going to move over to our industry lead on this panel today, Bill Ramsey. Hi, Bill. Hi, uh, thanks for having me today. Uh, my name is Bill Ramsey. I'm a principal with KTGY Architecture and Planning. Um, I lead our for sale or low density studio here locally. Um, that comprises of single family townhomes and condominiums, four stories or less. And I also serve on the uh, board of directors for KTGY. Awesome, so thrilled to have you join us, Bill. Okay, and last but obviously not least, uh, our cultural expert on the panel today, Patrick Kelly. Hey everybody, uh, really great to be here. Uh, yeah, my name is Patrick Kelly and I'm the founder of ChangePoint Consulting, uh, an organization we work with uh, organizations, everything culture related, culture strategy, uh, mergers and acquisitions, um, reorganization, uh, really the internal engine of uh, most organizations. So a lot of culture work and culture strategy. Um, like Kevin, I'm a Colorado native as well, born here in Denver and uh, love it. And um, I uh, just had a couple weeks ago, a little newborn, our first little kid. So if you hear the faint crying in the background, just know, uh, know that's where it's coming from. So really happy to be here. Awesome. And congratulations again. Thanks. Super cool news. Okay. So as Sarah said, we are going to divide up our culture and communication conversation today into three main segments. So as you follow along with us, we're gonna start off with defining culture. What is it? What does it mean? How do we live it? The second part is gonna give you a little bit of an inside look at some of the successes and challenges that 
our panelists have experienced in either communication culture or just our new normal right now because it's wild out there and then we're going to wrap up with a super fun look ahead where each of our panelists are going to share some thoughts and some closing points with you that we hope you can take away and put into practice in your own professional life or personal life cool all right and like sarah said we do have a q a function so if you'd like we do if we have time available we'll be able to answer questions as they relate to each of our three parts so feel free to type them on in as you think of them and we'll queue them either live during our segments or we'll answer it at the end either one so with that said we're going to start off with identifying culture and what does it all mean so company culture is that integral part of a business and it's the backbone of a really happy workplace we all have heard the word tossed around we want good company culture we see good company culture but how do we get there so how do we start to define it so patrick what are some of those key points or i don't know key strategies that you look towards when you're asked to expand upon what is the philosophy of good company culture yeah so so culture is obviously a very broad term and can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people um I, the, the way that i tackle it is not just uh what happy hours we plan or what our office space looks like um you know or, or the kegerator but i really see culture as a strategy um culture is is what you do you can create the best product in the world you can have a, a great financial plan you know we spend so much time as organizations planning annually what our budget is what our forecast is what we're going to do and yet very little time of saying how are we actually going to execute it how are we going to get the best out of our people in order to to be productive and so i see culture as really the other side of of that it's 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 strategy it should be built into your your plan and so when i go through in here i'm going to share my my screen a little uh, a chart that i often use uh, when working with my clients is um is this idea so hopefully everybody can see it so the, the whole idea with culture is is you want to create culture alignment and, and i'll go ahead and say too there's no one right way or one right culture every culture is unique and different um and that's what you want you don't want a culture that attracts everybody you don't want a culture that's bland you want it specific for for your group so whatever you define and whatever you align around you want it to be authentic to you so what i really go through is saying how do we create culture alignment and it's really working down the chart here you have your mission vision values which most organizations go through that's that's there um, they've, they've done exercises it's on a poster in the lobby or or what have you the really big breakdown that i see of establishing and creating great culture is really the second half of that from behaviors on so really what you want to do in order to create a great culture is you can have values you can have a mission and vision but what are the behaviors that you allow in the organization what are the clearly defined behaviors there's a exercise i go through with a lot of my clients where when we we look at our values and behaviors is we define it in term of in terms of the three c's so um, in terms of coworkers, clients and community um, so i often hear you know honesty or integrity are, are core values that i see those are very broad terms that can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people and some person might think they're falling within that or not but if you sit down as a group or as an organization say okay if, if honesty is our uh, one of our core values in terms of actual behaviors what does that mean between coworkers? when we say we're going to be honest between coworkers, what does that actually mean when we say we're going to be honest with our clients what does that mean if we're going to be honest with our community what does that mean uh, you now kind of create a, a tangible rubric and an idea of what it means to act and behave within a culture not just these broad broad terms when you go from there then what you want to do is saying okay if we say the mission vision values and these behaviors are important to us and we want these to be a part of our group we have to make sure that our goals support that um, and what i mean by that really goals structures and incentive is if we want to say we're going to act in this way we can't have goals that incentivize another way a very clear example of this it happened a number of years ago and they're still dealing with it was wells fargo uh, they i think have gotten three or four billion dollars in fines because they were opening up fake accounts and doing some very shady practices this was really a misalignment of their culture if you actually go on their website a couple of their core values are ethics first and do right by their customer um, obviously behaviors did not match that and that's because a lot of their goals and structure said open as many accounts as you can whatever you have to do you have to hit this number 
So people were incentivized and rewarded in different ways. So as we look across cultural land, we gotta make sure that the structures, how we're rewarding our people, how we're recognizing them, the goals of which we're doing align with the behaviors, values, the mission, the vision that we have, and that ultimately creates culture. Um, I always say culture should be something that you feel. It's not something that you could really explain, but just an idea of, yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm happy to be a part of this. But in order to get to that feeling, there's a lot of intentionality that's required in order to get there to create that alignment uh, along this path. So as we think about culture, that's the, really the perspective that I think of is, is how do we work as an organization to be very crystal clear of who we are, who we want to become, where we're going, and how we're going to create our structures and systems internally that match those goals. Awesome. Thank you, Patrick. And that's a great segue into my second question. How do we work as an organization? What are those core values? Who are we? And how do we put in place good culture and uphold it? So with that, I'm going to turn things over to our industry lead bill because we know we know we want culture but how does it flourish in the day to day so bill as a leader with kgty how do you ensure that your company culture is upheld secured promoted and valued well uh, i want to start with saying patrick that was a perfect introduction to culture i think that was really great um Culture really, it starts at the top. Um, as, as Patrick said, you have your values and your mission and the things that you want your, your company to be, but culture is not a passive activity. It doesn't just happen. You can't hope if we all do the right things that it will flourish and become itself. Culture really is a proactive thing to create. Um, it starts at the top by creating a framework for what you want to, to achieve, but then it all becomes it hinges on how it actually happens. And, and that's through the activities that you do, through the way you get your work done, through trainings and all these things that are really active actions that you need to pass on along your team. Um, one of the things that we like to talk about is parties and things like that. That's not your culture. That might be a reflection of your culture and a reflection of what it is like to work there, but that isn't your culture. Your culture really is the the day to day interactions and the things that build the soul of a company um, and how everybody can interact while they're there. So, you know, to, to really make it happen, it has to become an important uh, part of the, the, the company itself. Huge. Thank you, Bill. Appreciate that. And with that said, so Kevin, our young professional, how are you experiencing culture? How might a young professional experience this culture. Can you share with our listeners just how you are an active participant and a proactive participant in good culture as Bill chatted us through? Yes, Aaron, I mean, to the attendees, I mean, you can kind of see how we're working our way uh, down the line now to the, uh, you know, to the young leader side of things, which, you know, I'd argue, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's sort of the most, you know, the most important part of, uh, you know, of a company's culture you know, because you know, when it comes down to it, you know, we're the ones responsible for, you know, it, it comes around, it comes down to one word and that's engagement. You know, the daily engagements that we have, you know, you can have, you know, just to use an example, like you can have a, you can have a car producing, you know, you know, so much horsepower, but it only gets applied through the tires. Um, so, I mean, from a young leader perspective, I mean, we're responsible for, you know, moving that forward uh, daily. And I mean, no, like, no more is that apparent than, you know, right now during COVID um, that, you know, you need to, uh, you know, not only do we need to support each other as our peers, but we need to have the backs of our leadership. And I think it's, a, you know, it's, it's something that, you know, we, we support each other, but also, you know, if, if the, you know, if the mission and goals, you know, from our leadership, uh, you know, it's, it's a two-way street where, you know, if they don't necessarily align with, you know, with our, you know, with our idea of things, we need to communicate right back, you know, you know, what our wants and what our needs are. Cool. No, very, very well said, Kevin, and great analogy as, as Sarah pointed out. Well, that's awesome. So we got a great perspective on what culture is, how to proactively support it and ensure it uh, exists as also, how we experience it and how we're a participant in it. So with that said, and Kevin, you alluded a little bit to our next segment, which is that 
challenges and successes portion. And a lot of us have taken on this new normal very differently than how we started the year. So to start us off, it's no surprise to our panelists, to anyone joining us today, that our workplace environment has shifted radically over the last five months. And we are all continuing to adjust each and every day to this, this, new, this new landscape, this new normal. And it's weird. And in this ever evolving adjustment period, a lot of companies have found themselves struggling to preserve that workplace spirit. We're all working either remotely or within a smart social distance requirement. And our team communication and our FaceTime has depleted. So Patrick, in your experience, what holds a good firm, a good company, a good team back from really understanding and implementing a good environmental culture that can withstand these patterns and change that we're all going through right now? Yeah, there's a, there's a great quote I live by, not only in my personal life, but then in all my clients that I work with, is uh, conflict arises when expectations differ. And so if you think about any kind of conflict you have with a friend or a spouse or a coworker, uh, you can even look globally within different countries, really it's a variance of expectations. And so I think that as an organization, going back to that, that slide that I went through, the more that you can clarify expectations, make everything crystal clear and understanding uh, and everybody understanding what's going on, the, the ability to limit that conflict will be huge. Um, Again, going back to that, that example of, of values and being vague, you don't want to leave things vague. There's an example I always use is the word probably. Everybody knows what the word probably means, but some people use it as a deflector word, meaning if they say they're probably going to do something, there's like a 10% chance they'll actually do it. Whereas other people say probably means like a 90%, like unless something major comes up, I'll probably do it. Well, if two people communicate who have a different understanding of the word, there's going to be conflict, right? And so the more that we can be crystal clear about what we're trying to do and set those expectations as clear. And, and really the two biggest thing, and you hit on it, the areas that I see companies struggle with is really two sides of the same coin. It's trust and communication, uh, both feed on each other. When there's a lack of communication, we tend to trust less. We don't know what's going on. So we tend then to communicate less and it's this downward spiral. So first of all, as, as companies, especially now where we're more, more remote, over communication is key, right? You, you can't communicate enough or just make sure you're on the same, same page and checking in and making sure that everybody's knowing what they need to do. And, and I would say even to getting more of that personal support, uh, I think it's fair to say for anybody that is getting used to, or, or this is really their first experience of working from home, there's those feelings of isolation and um, uh, it feels a bit strange. Somebody said, it's not work from home, you live at work now. Um, so for a lot of people, it feels that way. It's, it's you just live at work now, it, it's hard to turn off. Uh, so I think the more that you can build that rapport and that trust uh, between your colleagues is important. And then something that Bill said that I think is wildly important to the biggest reason why I see culture struggle is the idea that it can be delegated or that it doesn't apply to leadership. Um, that it's, uh, that it's uh, this, that's HR's thing. Like, hey, go talk to HR. They're in charge of culture. Uh, if ever I hear that from a leader or somebody who's running a company, uh, I know that they're in for a world of hurt because it, it really has to be from leadership down. It has to be made important. I mean, it's, it's just like uh, a parent and a child, right? It, you can say one thing to your child and say this is important, but if your actions and behaviors are different, they're going to learn from the actions and behaviors, not just the words that you say. So I think as an organization is in these times is how do you become crystal clear? How do you set expectations? Um, how do you give leniency, build that trust and communication? And then more important than ever as, as leaders, and, and not even just senior leaders, if you're a manager of a small team, how do you mimic or how do you display the behaviors, actions that you want to see across your group? Um, that'll help a ton to limit those challenges you have and set you up for success in this, this crazy time. Awesome. Very well said. Thanks, Patrick. And I, lo I love that uh, phrasing or that understanding of the word probably. And it, it could be a real crutch. I will say I'll probably flub at least one more word during this webinar. So I just want to put that out there. That's, that's my honesty and my transparency. Anyways, let's keep going because uh, this, is, this is great. This is a great inside look at how we're all kind of dealing with this new normal. So Kevin, 
this might not be known for our attendees, but I know that you accepted a new position with a new company right at the uptick of March, right at the start of all this new fun. Uh, can you Perfect elaborate timing. a little bit on some of your challenges and successes that you experienced in starting with a brand new team at the onset of everything kind of changing from what you knew? Yeah, I mean, like you said, it was uh, it was at the very beginning of March, which was, you know, a heck of a heck of a time to be making a switch. You know, little did I know that only a handful of days in the office and we would all be uh, we would all be sent home. So, you know, that's it's something that was brand new to me and probably one of the scariest things I've encountered in my career because, you know, there's that, there's that worry, right. That, you know, if you're, uh, you know, if you're, if, you know, if you're, if you're the new guy and, you know, no one's, no one's necessarily seeing you, no one's really interacting with you, um, you know, and given, you know, the, how, you know, so many parts of the economy slowed down, you know, there's, you know, I was, I was, I was scared. Yeah. Um, for sure. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, a challenge, I mean, that was, that was it right then and there, you know, I didn't have that bond, that rapport with my, uh, you know, with my coworkers, um, you know, even taking it a step further, I, um, I have an engineer that, you know, we hired that she had a single day in the office before, um, before moving to a work from home environment. So literally did not know anyone in our office and our office is about 160 people here in the Denver tech center. So, you know, definitely, you know, a culture shock um, for me. Um, but, you know, as, you know, as the weeks went on, you know, we're, you know, what, four, four months into, um, you know, many of us still working from home, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here in the office, the office is mostly empty. Um, but it kind of came from two places, our successes. And one was, um, communication from our leadership, you know, so many of you know our peer organizations or just organizations in our industry, you know, people were sent home and they were kind of left in the dark. And there's just so many unknowns, and it breeds a lot of fear. Um, one of the things that you know our company has been doing well is, you know, every uh, initially every week, um, the leadership of our office was having a uh, having a Zoom call with us, you know, a quick Zoom call, updating us on the status of you know the world updating the status of our company, you know, of our offices and, you know, where we all stood. And that did wonders for our confidence and our security, knowing where we stood, you know, as a, uh, as a team that we didn't, uh, you know, we didn't look up, you know, to our leadership and, you know, encounter silence. And I think second is, you know, I, I have a, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer, so I'm also an introvert and um, I have a fear of picking up the phone. And, uh, you know, like a lot of my, uh, like a lot of my coworkers and what we sort of did was we kind of, um, we set up times to talk every single day. We actually carved out dedicated time to, you know, whether that was 15 minutes or whether it was an hour, um, connect with each other every day, um, both within my team and, you know, to other people, um, outside in our different departments and, you know, coming out of this, you know, as things start to loosen up, you know, I've found myself, you know, really connected with people that I haven't even met yet. Um, you know, but it's, it's sort of that, that daily, that daily engagement, you know, repetitive um, and continuous. Awesome. Thanks, Kevin. And I'm sure it's going to keep getting fun from here on out. So now over to Bill, I want to hear about what recent changes you've experienced and how you've preserved culture through those experiences and what steps might have you taken to pivot and respond to this new normal, but also maintain the, the key fundamentals in your company? Sure. So, yeah, I, I think that's right. I mean, basically our cheese has moved. Um, and so we have to sort of uh, change the way we go after sort of keeping our culture alive. And one of the things is we're in a situation where you can't just try to wait this out. Um, I, I amazingly have heard that from other leaderships and other companies like, oh, we'll be fine on the other side of this. And to me, that's a recipe for disaster. Um, if anything, it, it, it takes stepping back and thinking, okay, how can we preserve what we have through different means and different communication uh, techniques? Um, you know, one thing that's really big at KTGY is sort of a collaborative environment and that's very challenging to do remotely. So. Um, we've set up a lot of things like we do a daily check-in every single morning at 8:30. We hop on a, a Zoom call with everybody, 
Um, typically that meeting is five to 15 minutes, pretty short, but it gives everybody a chance to just talk about what they're working on, ask for help, potentially help somebody else with, with everybody. And it just keeps that visual connection. So it still gets to feel like a team. Um, Kevin, you hinted on sort of the, the uncertainty within a company. Um, one of the things that we've been doing as a board is KTGY has an internal uh, messaging system called Connect. It's essentially Facebook for KTGY. It's everybody's home screen on their computer. And it's a, it's a way that we can talk across all of our offices across the United States. But we've been using it a lot lately to make sure we're communicating between leadership and, and staff members where every single Monday, our CEO makes a, board, uh, a post just about what's going on in the company, what they might be seeing internally or in the industry or what's going on in our world just to keep that communication there on a, a very regular basis. And then we also have board members doing posts every other week. Uh, the same thing is we wanna make sure that it, it's very easy to assume that all the team members can, can know what's going on, but that's just not possible. And so we're making sure that that communication from leadership to the staff is happening on a regular basis. Um, and as this has evolved, we've been very careful to not lose some of what makes us who we are. Um, we're very proud of things like our internship program. We're big on leadership and professional development. And we're one of the only architecture firms I know of that didn't cancel their summer internship program. We actually ended up expanding it. We created a virtual internship program and we opened it up to a lot of the different schools um, very late, letting them know that any top students that might have lost their internship could apply for our virtual program. So we have something set up. I believe we have 27 interns this summer um, that are part of our virtual program. They have um, sort of a very structured class and then working environment. So they get uh, spoke to by different leaders within the company. And then they also get the opportunity to work on projects. And it's actually even a paid internship. So we're not asking these people to volunteer. We've structured a system to be able to continue something that's really important to us internally during this. So I think the overall thing is you have to look at what makes your company who it is and then look at how you can continue that or evolve it or change it during these times instead of just simply trying to wait it out. And Bill, if I, uh, if I may, um, Sarah, yeah, I mean, there's a, you know, there's a famous, um, you know, famous piece written by, uh, by Viktor Frankl, you know, if you're familiar with, you know, was a, uh, you know, in a concentration camp during World War II. You know, he he differentiated those that survived and those that did not by those that were, you know, a you know looking at it as okay, I just have to wait this out until things go back to normal, you know that I just have to hold on, and the other side of well, this is the new normal. I must adapt to this. There is no end, and you know there may not be an end in sight, and you know the people that adapted that latter you know mindset you know ended up thriving and. It's kind of cool that you mentioned the uh, the internship project. You know, we did you know sort of the same thing, where um, our interns are virtual and they're paid a stipend. Um, it's abs you know it's it's obviously compressed, but you know we don't want to you know wait um, and pass up opportunities that uh, you know will help us you know will help us grow. That's so cool. Yeah, thank you so much, Bill and Kevin. Great follow up there. Thank you. So much, very cool. All right, so this last part is gonna be that look ahead that I'm gonna ask you guys just for some closing thoughts, some commentary, some questions that I think all innately have an optimistic spirit and will ensure that we know that culture can continue, good team community, see? Team communication can flourish and we're all gonna to continue to be our best selves and do our best work. Because the goal here is not just to survive, like Kevin said, but to thrive, to evolve, and to really build resilience. So, Kevin, um, now that this new normal is kind of staying the course, and like you said, we're, we're not waiting this out. We're all pivoting and adjusting within this new world we're all exhibiting. What is exciting you or what is making you kind of curious and kind of elated about what could come based on what we're all experiencing right now? Is there anything on the horizon or in the year or in next year to come that you're, you're stoked about? I mean, it is, it is the new normal, but I am, you know, I am excited for when I can go to a concert again. 
Um, so there's that. Um, on the workplace side of things, you know, I'm I'm so stoked for just to see the the evolution of the workplace. You know, something as you know as big as you know is working from home or that flexibility. You know, I think that's something that's kind of been you know on the uh, you know on the line for a while. And this you know on an optimistic side has kind of given you know the industry the push that it needs to kind of bring that into the you know into the mainstream really. Um, you know that, and you know from from my level as a young leader, a lot of the practices that we've adapted as a company, and you know, you know, Kimley Horn is you know maybe four thousand people, so you know there are a lot. You know, they've got some solid leaders, but you know, from almost a grassroots perspective, you know, it's 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 people at my level that have been able to shape a lot of the a lot of the best practices, you know, and it's kind of shed that inhibition of you know one you know being able to speak, you know, speak up to leadership, to, you know, to communicate, you know, what it is we want. And it's really turned out for, uh, for the better. And I'm looking forward to, you know, to being able to have that voice, you know, even coming out of this. Awesome. So true, Kevin, definitely feel you on the, the concert front and the music front and the, the just gathering for things, but as well as, yeah, that push into what is virtual work look like and how do we all work our best remotely. Uh, so with that said, I now want to pivot it over to Patrick, because especially working with multiple clients in multiple industries, you've probably seen some or heard some really good about some really good reactionary change that's coming out of this and that could potentially create or help build a new foundation in some of those stabilizing points about good company culture or reinforcing those stabilizing points in company culture. So can you, can you share with us some of those reactionary changes you've seen and where do you think we're going? Yeah. Um, you know, change is always hard. I would say one of the biggest obstacles when you look at culture change or anything in general is you get comfortable where you're at. Um, and even though it might be better, sometimes it's 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 there. There's a there's a quote I love, um, and it's uh, how's it go? Uh, yes, I know I'm in hell, but at least I know the street names. And it's the idea that you know I know I'm not in a good place, but it's comfortable, and I kind of know it's it's why people tend to stay in a job longer than they are. Well, this this COVID has forced everybody to change. Like whether you like it or not, every business has been disrupted. And so I think there is incredible opportunity right now for every organization to rethink and redecide what they want their culture to be, how they want to work, how they want to grow, because we're already disrupted and we're open for change right now. And maybe open for change, but we're also maybe have experience that change is okay, we can deal with it, right? When everybody works from home. And, and I've, I've seen from a lot of organizations is that maybe some of their core principles or beliefs or understanding, especially from leaders, have been challenged or if they've been forced to push away from them. Like I know a ton of organizations that have always pushed back on work from home, right? And even though I can argue with them that really at the core of that is, is a trust issue because it's always, well, how do we know they're working? You know, will they get this done? And I would always just say, so you don't trust your people. Oh, no, no, we trust our people. But I like to see and know that they're working. I'm like, okay, so you don't trust your people. Um, but so you have all of these kind of preconceived notions or beliefs that are now challenged or being changed that I, I think, you know, I would say not even reactionary change. For the last three or four months, most companies have been reactionary and rightly so trying to figure out what's going on. The quicker any organization can now start thinking proactively moving forward and going back to that chart right now and saying, okay, where do we want to go? Who do we want to become? What internal systems, structures, processes, how do we want to think about this? The quicker that you can start having some of those dialogues and conversations as organizations and chart that new path, the quicker you will, A, uh, be successful and find a new normal, and two, probably beat your competition. Um, there's a lot of people lagging and, and struggling right now, and uh, Kevin, you said that great quote of, of just adapting the new normal. This is, this is the way it is. And, and I think it's important to understand, too, that the workplace has been changing pretty rapidly for the last 10 or 15 years, right? Even before COVID, we work fundamentally different than we did 10 or 15 years ago. Um, this went a little quicker. I would say maybe the only benefit of COVID is um, everybody's not just blaming millennials now because of workplace changes. It's finally a different topic. Um, so I guess they're now blaming millennials for they're the ones 
getting most infected now, but uh, I, I think that we got to understand that change is always happening. Uh, it's always going to be there. And instead of fighting, I, I see with what great cultures are doing, instead of fighting against change, is creating a dynamic culture that's always ready for change. Because next year is going to be different. In three years, it's going to be different. Um, don't build a culture for this point in time. Build a culture that can adapt to any point in time. And that goes back to those key principles we were talking about. Building communication, uh, building trust. Uh, how do you create a place where people can openly communicate what's going on? Because depending on what department you're in, depending on what office you're in, what state you're in, what team you're on, what level you're at, you're gonna see things within your organization differently. And I think one of the biggest issues I see that, that happens is it becomes too much of a right versus wrong conversation uh, instead of a, what are you seeing? Um, an example I always give is if you had this circle and half the circle was blue, half the circle was white, and four people were standing around it, and you asked them what does the circle look like, you'd get four different answers because they would only be seeing part of the circle. No one's wrong, but you just have a different perspective of where you're at and where you're sitting. Uh, the more that as leadership teams, and even as um, no matter where you're at, is take an empathetic understanding of what people are seeing, learn to communicate, because the more that you can communicate and build that trust of what people are seeing, the more you're going to be able to adapt to what's happening. Because a lot of your frontline workers, a lot of our young professionals, they feel some of the changes happening before leadership. So how do you create an environment where they can openly say, hey, here's what I'm seeing, here's what I'm going, Bill, you said that with what your CEO is sending out, here's the changes I'm seeing going on. How do you get those inputs from across your organization? How do you get people now, especially involved in the conversation of saying, we want everybody to help create the new vision, the new direction of what our culture is going to be. We want, to, we want everybody involved of establishing how we work. What are the structures? What are, how are we going to reward? How are we going to recognize? Not only will you get great diverse thought, but you'll engage everybody and people wanting to be a part of it that will lead great results moving forward. So I think the quicker that you as an organization can start having these conversations and see the unbelievable opportunity that's here to completely reinvent and rethink and reestablish good communication and trust with your team, you're going to be wildly, wildly successful. Awesome. Yes. Thanks, Sarah, Patrick. if I may. Yeah, go Kevin. Yeah. I mean, I absolutely, you know, it I would agree that, you know, there's an absolute opportunity to, you know, as I would put it, go on the offensive, you know, with, you know, you know, for us and, you know, for the attendees, you know, with your companies, you know, so, you know, potentially, you know, sort of shaken up in structure, you know, there's a chance to sort of re-solidify even stronger, you know, you know, Patrick, what you were saying about, you know, creating a culture for, you know, for a certain point in time, you know, there's that just we'll, we'll say in general for companies you know, like that, you know, we, we can no longer, we can no longer go to the bar together for happy hour. The kegerator's not there. You know, we're all at home. You know, something that my team's done is we've, we've, we've shifted that thought to not be necessarily, you know, okay, how many coffees can we get or how many, you know, yeah, happy hours can we go to? You know, we started with, you know, the, uh, maybe maybe it's a dreaded term now but the virtual happy hour but we kind of turned it on its side a little bit and um you know our mission was to create you know our mission now is to create opportunity for social interaction and the way we kind of turned it on its side for our team was we would still have a virtual happy hour but there was someone who was a point person for each happy hour that was responsible for sharing photos from a vacation or thoughts on a book they read. So it kind of gave them some, you know, gave them some airtime. Um, whereas, you know, if they went to a happy hour, maybe they were sort of the wallflower, the quiet one. Well, it kind of, you know, got everyone to, you know, to get to know them a little bit better. So yeah, it's that it, it's definitely an opportunity to bring your team, you know, together to make them even stronger. Awesome. Great segue, Kevin. Now, before I pitch it to Bill, Patrick, we got one question in as you were talking about that trust and how we can ensure that our, our organizations are trusting one another, working from home, working remotely. We got one question in and I'm just going to read it so it will be direct and ensure that we answer it correctly. But I'm going to pitch this one to you, Patrick. The question is, I hope it's fair to say that for some of us, good company culture is really important but we also enjoy working remotely and we're very successful working from home. Can we have both? And if so, how can you help other colleagues and managers believe or understand that? So that's very in line with 
the look ahead because mm -hmm. like you said, the workforce was already changing. People were already working from home, but how do we ensure that the people that were successfully working from home are valued for that success? And how do we ensure that there's a great balance between the two? And with that question, how do we communicate the value in each of those successes, either in a team office environment or an internal office environment versus a home environment? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, great question. There's a lot there. Um, we could probably yeah. spend a lot of time taking on that. I, you're exactly right. I mean, when we look at what's going through and what's what's happening here with COVID, I think I read something recently, 80 or 85 percent, they, they did a poll of, of workers and 80 or 85 percent said they want to continue to work from home in some kind of capacity. Um, so you've opened a floodgate here and you've done a couple of different things. And it goes back to those preconceived notion is that people have realized, yeah, I can be productive at home. Um, it, you got to still set some parameters and, and, and some of those things, but the idea of not having to commute, um, there is, there is, I think one of the greatest things any culture can do is, is to get off quote unquote, the clock, which is do your job in the best way that you see possible, how you do it, where you do it. In what capacity, you know, if you make sure you're available in certain times, but when you're working from home, somebody's not staring at you the whole time. So, you know, if you need to go change your laundry or go walk the dog real quick or grab a lunch, you know, nobody's, nobody's having you, but it feels good to say, I'm kind of working in the best way that works for me. So I think what it stems with is, again, mutual understanding, mutual expectations is how do you, as a leadership team, facilitate and understand where people are at, what makes them work best, have very clear understandings of what outcomes they're looking for. Um, I think a big reason people struggle with working from home or that idea of I don't know what they're doing is they maybe don't have clear outcomes that they've given them of what they actually need to do. Um, bad managers, if you're a bad manager, the easiest way to recognize or to see if your employee's working is just to see if they're sitting in a desk for eight hours. It's, it's terrible and it's awful, but that's that's the reality. So I think it's coming together and and well, as we just said is how do you get together as a team and say, how are we gonna recognize if we're gonna work from home, how are we going to still support each other? Is this going to be okay? What kind of outcomes do you need from me in order to show you that I'm still providing that value? Um, and let's talk about ways that we can be included. All the, the examples that Kevin gave are, are perfect and Bill with the, with the check-in every day. There's ways to still connect and be connected. And, and, and maybe it's just once a week you head into the office to get some of that social piece. But all, all it does is just really require some intentional thinking and honest conversation with your team members. To establish new ground rules, new understanding, and um, a new framework for how you want to work. Love it. Honest, transparent communication. Love it. So Bill, now I'm going to pitch it to you for the look ahead portion and ask you what's exciting you in this new normal or what is coming out of this new change that you're hopeful about. And how can we as young professionals help you get there? So I think it is an exciting time right now. Um, evolution or uh, culture is always evolving within a company. It's never stagnant, but things like we're going through right now with, with COVID accelerate change. Um, a very easy example is KTGY rolls out uh, goals in three-year lots. We do three-year goals. We share them with all of our, our, our teammates. And in 2020, we rolled out our new three-year uh, sort of set of goals and one of them was to establish a flexible work from home schedule for all of our staff um, our three-year plan became a three-month plan in march when we sent all six of our offices home and really accelerated that schedule um, it's safe to say we haven't perfected it by any means but it sure did speed up that that process and it's created a lot of great learning environments and now as we hopefully are starting to see the other side of this we can start imagining what does a flexible schedule look like? How can we balance this with, you know, people's family needs or just what they like and how they want to get their work done? You know, Patrick said the most important thing is getting your work done well. It's not getting your work done well in the office at 9.15 in the morning. It's that the project gets done well. And so it's looking at ways to, to adapt what was the norm um, into a new norm and to do it in a way that makes things better. It doesn't just work, but it's an improvement process. Um, when I talk you know, about you know, how, can, how can you help us get there is leadership is at all levels. Um, you know, you, there's leadership at every level within every company. And as you know, more senior leaders love to see the leadership you know, 
of lower levels give them advice and direction because there's experiences that we just can't be having on a day-to-day -day basis that everybody else is. You know, Kevin, you talked about the tires hitting the road. Well, that's where we need feedback. And, you know, I would, I would hope that all leaders are going to listen to that information given to them. Um, there may be speed bumps or other things along the way that make impl uh, implementation challenging, but that feedback is so important to the long-term success of a company. It's going to help them evolve and how things work. And someday that those leaders, you know, those young leaders become senior leaders and become the people driving a company. And so this is just giving you all that opportunity to have a voice in the room is what your company needs to be as it evolves. Awesome. Very cool. And I love the, the concept of leaders on all levels and that evolution. That's so freaking cool. So with that, just a few concluding thoughts, and we do have a few minutes available if anyone has any questions they'd like to answer live with our group. Um, Sarah McDaniel is monitoring for any hand raises or anyone that would like to ask a question live in our webinar. So today, you've heard from a cultural expert, Patrick Kelly, uh, who's helping to really establish and teach some of these working fundamentals. And you've also heard from one of our favorite building industry leads, Bill Ramsey, ensuring that these values are upheld and proactively promoted in our offices and within our teams. And you've also heard from one of our peers, one of our YLC members, Kevin Jonk, who's experiencing much of the same growth and development that we are all a part of and will continue to be a part of. So I hope today you've enjoyed this conversation and I hope just maybe, I mean, maybe you've learned something new or you've had one of your principles and one of your core values reinforced into something even more tangible and more concrete in what motivates you and inspires you. And, or maybe, hell, maybe you've just simply gained insight and on our platforms and programs that could help you and your company build lasting innovation and culture. So on behalf of myself and the YLC, I want to just quickly thank and acknowledge each of our panelists for volunteering their time. And I will stop talking to see if we have any questions from the audience. Anyone? Sarah McDaniel, do you have any questions for us? Well, I just saw one pop up um, from Brian, and he says, I see the importance of check-ins and meetings when a work-at-home situation kicks off, but have you, any of you found that meetings are easier to schedule and consequently more frequent? Any thoughts on blocking off time to get your job done when the day quickly fills up with meetings? Yeah, Bill. Um, so I do that. I do that on a daily basis. I will block off um, time for certain tasks um, where I will make myself unavailable. I think when there's something specific to do, that's a great, uh, a great technique to getting it done. Um, it's also a good way to force yourself to do that. If you block off one or two hours in your, in your calendar with a specific task and then the little reminder pops up, you're gonna feel pretty motivated to actually get to that task that you've potentially been delaying or other things have been getting in the way of. So that, that's the technique I use on a regular basis. Um, I do tend to see more meetings in my day than I used to, but I think a lot of that is in response. I used to be able to just tap somebody on the shoulder and bounce ideas off of them and that's more challenging now. So getting a structured way to keep the collaboration has, has proven important. Very true. I mean, it's an exercise. It's an exercise in drawing boundaries, right? Um, because you know, there's a lot of times you can you can put that time off on your calendar, but maybe your coworkers know that you know if they schedule something during it that you'll give. So it's kind of a it's a matter of kind of drawing that line to say, no, I do need to get this done. And I mean, you know, from where from where I'm at professionally, you know, I'm sort of half in production, half in meetings. So you know, it's a it's a difficult uh, you know it's a difficult dance. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would. You know, we, you know, like Bill was saying, we have a daily check in every morning and I try to keep, you know, so many hours outside of that, you know, as, as my like get stuff done, um, you know, time and, you know, I've communicated to people that, you know, that's, you know, like 
that that's my, that's my time to get stuff done and they res and they respect that but it's all about you know drawing that boundary and communicating very clearly that you know that time is you know sacred to you thank you kevin yeah and a question also came into the chat uh more of a bone backbone question um but yes this webinar is recorded and it will be available for our hba members and young professionals uh, Connie and Sarah might have a little more of the details on if and when it will be available, but yes, the intent of this webinar is to ensure that this learning is available. One of, one of my learned benefits in this new normal is that there's, there's a bunch of information. This would have been a live event and it would have been, it would have occupied a certain part of time, but now we kind of have this weird ability to be able to look back and relive some of these webinars that we've enjoyed. I know I've benefited in recorded webinars. So yes, we will, we will be recorded. Are there any more questions from any of our attendees or do our panelists have questions for each other? You know, Patrick, really quickly, I, I would be curious, you know, with, with change point, I mean, ever since March has happened, I mean, what's the, what's the biggest pivot you've seen from, you know, from your clients asking, um, asking for your help, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's been beforehand, like, you know, you know well, we want to, you know, we want to establish, you know, good, good culture broadly. I mean, has it, has it been more pointed? Has it been, you know, has there been a major shift in the services that you've provided? Yeah, I would say, not a major shift, but definitely a focus, um, you know, instead of just general, maybe defining and understanding is, is redefining and thinking the rules of the game of how we operate in a, in a remote workforce. I mean, that's been the biggest challenge or getting people back to work safely or, um, yeah, just anything really of, of how we engage, knowing that, that it's going to be a little different. So, um, you know, that last question by Brian is, is spot on, just talking through things like that of, how do we balance our calendars? How do we interact and block off time? When are, when are we available? When are we not? Because it is very easy to just always be available. And so how do we set some of those ground rules of at a certain time, you know, you're, you're off or you, you won't be responding right away. Um, I, I think that's been the biggest challenge. And then on top of that too, I would say a big focus has just been how are we going to survive for a lot of companies? Um, double checking our clients still around, what kind of work can we do? Uh, I think we're getting through that and we're, we're starting to understand for a lot of companies and clients like, okay, we know how to survive. We know what we're doing. We know where our revenue source is going to be. And now starting again to transition to that proactive side of things of let's take this time to really redefine every aspect. Do, do our mission values, vision, do those still align with what we're trying to do? Do they align with our structures? Um, are we rewarding and recognizing in the right way? Um, it's just a great opportunity to, to rethink everything. So true. So cool. So I think with that, we are going to conclude our webinar today. I want to once again thank all of our panelists or all three of our panelists for volunteering their time to speak with us today. Our contact information should be available on the screen for you to have a look at. If you have any questions that you want to pitch to one of us after the session concludes, Patrick, Bill, and Kevin, thank you all so much. The YLC thoroughly appreciates your interest in connecting with our members today and volunteering your time. And the YLC will be following up with you after this webinar concludes to further extend our, our gratitude. What a great topic and what a timely event. Thank you for joining us today. And we have to close with something fun that I'm trying to perfect, the Zoom high five, where you like high five your neighbor if you're in the cube this way and that way. So I don't know which way everyone's screen is, so you can high five this way, this way, but Kevin's above me, Patrick's below me, Bill's kind of off to the side, so high five everyone. Thank you again, this was so much fun. <laughs>